Father, I pray, uh, Lord, would you just continue to open our eyes this morning, God. We want to see some things we haven't seen. Lord, we want to hear some things we haven't heard. And most of all, God, we want to continue this journey of being conformed into the image of Jesus Christ. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Everyone said? Amen. 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 Um, we have been on a little bit of a journey for a few weeks. And we are, we, we are looking at what were some of the wells. What were some of the wells that the early church drank from? that gave them life and gave them uh, the ability to become a movement here on planet Earth that didn't just kind of, you know, gradually trickle away. At one point, it was said that they had turned the world upside down. Wouldn't it be great to be known, to be a part of that generation of believers in Jesus who the outside world look and go, oh my goodness, here they are, not those annoying Christians, not those, those hypocrites that say this and do that, but what if they were to say, oh, here's those guys, they're gonna, we don't want to admit they're going to turn the world upside down again. Wouldn't that be great to be a part of that uh, and have that claim thrown against God's people again today? Well, I, I think it can happen again. Who believes it can happen again? Amen. Yep, we've got the Holy Spirit with us. It's not by our might, nor our power, nor our brilliance, nor our intellect that the world is going to be reached. It's going to be by us humbly submitting to God and learning to, to be aware of the presence of the Holy Spirit and listening to God as he guides us throughout our day. And We don't have to uh, run at people and Bible bash them, but we can just wait for those divine moments and encounters where the Lord speaks to us and so on. So I believe that God's doing something in the church. And I do believe that what he's doing is part of the, what God is doing is he's bringing us back to what were the things at the very beginning? that gave life to the early church. And I've, I've challenged you guys too as we go through this, that what were some of the things in your early walk with God? What were some of the fountains, some of the wells that you drank from in your early relationship with God? We've, we've, we all, when we look back at our early days when we first came to faith, there are certain things. I don't, you can call them disciplines. You can call them programs. You can call them whatever you want to call them. But there were certain things that you went to, wells where you went and you drank. And the, it wasn't the well itself. It's what you got out of the well that you know built into your life. It built fire into your heart. It built passion for God. It built, it built desire to want to get into this collection of ancient documents and see what these writers saw about God. It, it, it drove you to your knees where you wanted to pray. You didn't have to. It wasn't a religious duty. You wanted to. And all of that stuff in the early days, it came from certain wells and places that we drank from. So we're on a bit of a journey. We're looking at the church, the early church, but I'm encouraging you as well as we go through this because here's what I believe when I look at this. What the early church drank from that gave them that life and vitality and passion for Jesus, the stuff they drank from in the beginning, when I go back and look at the early days of my faith, you know, that's the same stuff I drank from. It was no different. I went to some of those same places and they put life in me and courage in me and they built my faith to a place where I actually believed that the God that these ancient documents talk about was the God that these ancient documents said he actually was. Amen? He was this God. Not some other type of God, not a watered down version. Anyone like cordial? Anyone drink cordial? No? It's not very popular anymore, is it? When I was a kid, I used to love cordial because, you know, it just made water taste different. And so you get the, the cordial and you sort of dilute it. And, and, and if you drink the cordial straight out of the bottle, anyone ever, ever do that? Oh, it is so potent and strong. And here's the thing, you can't help but know that you've, you've, you've put that thing in your head. It just overtakes every sense and everything's on alert and so on. But then you water it down, don't you, with water and it becomes a little more palatable. And somewhere along the line, maybe, just maybe, we've, we've adopted a more watered down version of God that's a lot more culturally palatable than the real version of God that the early church encountered and knew and that the early church went about and told people about and preached. So we're on a bit of a journey where we're going back and looking at some of those wells. I was listening to uh, a podcast earlier this week and uh, Rick Warren, anyone heard of Rick Warren? Purpose Driven Life and then Purpose Driven Everything. Um, Rick Warren, he uh, said this on a podcast, he said, the church at the beginning was the church at its best. The church at the beginning was the church at its best. And I really resonate with that uh, idea. And that's kind of what we're doing. We're going back and we're just trying to have a bit of a look at the church at the beginning. Last week we looked at two wells of the early church. The first one was the well of the Holy Spirit's power and presence. And we talked a bit about the presence and power of the Holy Spirit in the early church. And then the second one we talked about was the well of the prayer of faith. It was not the well of prayer because people pray all the time all over the world. All religions pray. The early church didn't just pray. They actually prayed with faith. 
They prayed believing that A, God was there and he listened, and B, that when they got up off their knees, they opened their eyes and ears and went looking for the answers because they knew their heavenly Father was going to answer their prayers. Might not always be the answer they want, but he's going to answer them. Amen. So we looked at those two. So this week, I just want to uh, talk about the third well. And the third well that the early church drank from, and I know I did in my early days as well, was the well of spiritual awareness. It's the well of spiritual awareness. My uncle used to own a house over East Ballina there some years ago, and he backed onto a nature reserve. And he told me a story that forever changed my life. To this day, the ramifications of the story he shared with me are a part of my DNA, and I can't help it. One morning, he used to own a milk run. He woke up one morning, and he used to get up at like 2.30, 3 o'clock in the morning, and then be in the truck at 3.30 and picking up the milk bottles and delivering them all and so on. One morning, he got out of bed, and he, he was, couldn't find something, and he, so he walked out the front to his truck, and he said, Alan, as I stepped out my front door, I trod on something. It was just really kind of rubbery, like a big hose. Anyway, a couple of steps over this big hose, I went out to the, to the truck, and I got something out, and then I pulled my phone out and put my light on, and he said, as I walked back towards the door, there was this dirty, great big carpet snake wrapped up at my front door. Now... I don't like snakes. Anyone like snakes? Put your hand down. I, I don't want to know if you do. Okay, it'll taint my image of you. I'll think there's something wrong and I want to pray for you. Okay, but I hate snakes. But he told me that story. So you know what I do now? Every time without fail, this is, well, I've, I've got three doors at my house. There's a front door, there's a back door, and there's a side door that goes out to the sort of side area. And every time, ever since he told me that story, every time I open a door in my house, you know what I do? First thing I do, every time I open a door, I look down at the bottom of the door. I don't know why, but ever since he told me that, I've suddenly become aware that there could be a snake sitting at the door because snakes are known to do that, or they've done it at least once. I know that. And they'll sit at the door, and once is enough. Once is enough. And, and so I'm now living with this great awareness that there could be a snake at my front door. So every time I go to my door, I look down to make sure that there's no snake. Now, it doesn't mean there will be a snake at my door. I'm not expecting a snake at my door. But in case there is, I'm aware. So I'm actually looking. So I'm actually looking. You know, there was a Barner survey done some years back. George Barner does all these surveys. And a survey was done of the US church about 10 years ago. And here's uh, something that they found that I, I found quite startling. They found that 40% of Americans agree that Satan is not real. Satan is just a symbol of evil that the ancient writers wrote about. But there is no reality to the... Uh, what we would call Satan or, or the devil. It's just a symbol that ancient writers use to represent the fact that there is evil in the world. Now, I found that quite shocking. But I found the next one even more shocking. Just under 60% agreed that the Holy Spirit was not real. The Holy Spirit was just a symbol written by the ancient writers to symbolise the fact that there's good things in the world as well. Now, this is a survey done of people sitting in churches on Sunday morning worshipping, paying tithes, uh, going to small groups, uh, I'm assuming praying, reading the Bible, all this stuff. But there's no awareness of the reality of the fact that, you know what, there is something more to the world than just what we see, taste, touch, feel and smell. I've been getting my eyes checked recently. About every six to 12 months, uh, I, I, I go and get them checked, ever since I turned my sort of mid-40s. And um, I had one a couple of weeks ago, and the, the lady told me that what's happening now, she said, one of my eyes is deteriorating, and the other one stayed the same. So she said, you've actually got, you've got vision in both eyes, but one of your eyes sees better than the other eye can see. Now, as believers, we're called to live a life with two existing realities, aren't we? We're called to live with a reality, a knowledge of the reality of this natural world that we live in, but also beyond the veil of this natural world, there is a spiritual dimension to life, and we're called to be aware of that. Now, some of us are like the, that survey that was done in the US. We don't even believe in the spiritual realm. There are people that don't even believe in the spiritual realm. It's all about the here and the now. Angels, demons, all that stuff, they're all mythological things. And, and maybe you agree with that. Maybe you think that they're all just symbolic and, and so on. But as we're going to see, I don't think the early church treated the spiritual realm as just something that was symbolic or that was some way of logically explaining the good and the evil that happened in life. And there'll be other people in this room, and you'll be a little bit like me. You'll have stronger vision in one eye. And usually it's the natural. Not thinking that the spiritual realm has much relevance to my life, this side of death. But the truth of the matter is the early church were very, very aware 
that there was a spiritual dimension to life, but there was also a natural dimension to life. And we need to learn to live with an awareness of both realms and an understanding that both dimensions are not two separate entities that do not come into play. According to what these ancient writers wrote, these two dimensions seem to have moments and times where they come and they clash and they divide. Have you ever heard the saying, don't be so heavenly minded that you have no earthly use? Have you ever heard that? Yeah, don't be so heavenly minded that you have no earthly use. I actually agree with that. But the truth is that we're probably on the other end of the spectrum to a certain degree. We're more earthly minded that maybe we're no heavenly use. Everything is about the natural. Everything is about here and now. Everything is about what I can see, taste, touch, feel and smell. And I've rationalised anything supernatural or mystical out of my, my belief system so that it all is just about what's down here, what I can see, taste, touch, feel, smell, what I can control, what I can quantify, what I can measure. And anything outside of that is just maybe hocus pocus or, or fairy tale or fairyland. Now, let me be transparent. I want to make it very clear I'm not the kind of person who sees a devil in everything. Okay? I do not see a devil in everything. So please don't think Alan's up here saying everything's the devil. I'm not. I do not see a devil in everything. But the problem is that some people fail to see a devil in anything. We fail to see a, a spiritual connection to just about anything that happens in life. The reality is this. The spiritual and the natural are not two separate worlds disconnected from each other. They're one world created by God and blended together by divine design. They're both created by God and they have been blended together and it's the divine design of God that has blended these two realms or these two worlds together. And if one world was to be more dominant, then it would make sense to me that it would be the spiritual realm because it was here long before the natural was and it will continue on long after this natural world is removed and its used by death has been breached. So the spiritual dimension and spiritual awareness was a really, really important part of the early church. And I know when I first got saved, how many of you know you, if there was no such thing as a spiritual dimension, you would never have been saved in the first place, amen? Colossians talks about that, 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 that Jesus, Colossians chapter 1 says that when we came to faith, that we were literally pulled out of the kingdom of darkness and placed supernaturally into the kingdom of God's beloved son of Jesus. Something happened to you spiritually, you were literally transported. Now physically, you didn't, you didn't disappear anywhere. You stood somewhere and invited Christ into your life and your physical body stayed exactly where it was. But supernaturally, in the spiritual dimension, something happened. You were taken from one realm and placed into another realm. Now, perhaps the most well-known New Testament writing about the divine connection between the two worlds is found in Paul's writings to the Ephesians. In Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 12, Paul writes this. He says, we do not wrestle against what? Flesh, flesh and blood. Not, not, not everything I'm going through is a battle against flesh and blood. Right? He says, we don't wrestle with flesh and blood, but we do wrestle, by the way. Okay, we do wrestle. He says, we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness. Where? In the heavenly places. In heavenly places. So he's saying, that's us. We. We wrestle. Christians in this natural world, right? Does everyone agree with that? He's talking to us. He's talking to the Ephesian believers. Could be talking to us. He's talking to human people living in the natural plane, saying, you wrestle, but you're not wrestling with a whole bunch of things necessarily always on the same plane as you, you're wrestling with something in another plane called the heavenlies or the spiritual dimensions. So there's an interaction between these two. He's making it very, very clear to them that you're wrestling, yes, there's a battle going, but not everything you're fighting is a natural battle. Not everything is natural. I was talking to a, a young couple this week, uh, uh, and they were saying that um, the husband was telling me that a few weeks ago they went to a church service and they got a, a, a word from the Lord. They, they felt like God had been sort of, you know, had some things for them and so on. And, and this, this lady came up and prayed for them and gave them a word and, and it really resonated. Yes, we really believe that's God speaking to us about something that he has for us down the track. And they were really excited about that. He said, well, you would not believe it. He said, the minute we got uh, uh, in the car and drove home, he said, we have fought like cats and dogs from the minute it happened. This was a couple of weeks ago. He said, we have not stopped fighting. And he explained some of the fights to me. And I'm, I'm going, oh, dude, that is heavy. Have not stopped fighting. And so I asked him this question. Do you think that what's going on there, do you think it's just all about the natural stuff that you're fighting about? Or is it possible that there's something going on behind the scenes? Could it be possible that there's stuff going on behind the scenes that you're not spiritually aware of 
that could be having an impact on this natural world. Let me ask you some questions. Anyone ever have a bad mood? Ever have a bad mood and you don't know why? Anyone? Ever get a really bad... Yeah. Uh, 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 you get a bad mood and you're down the dumps and you don't know why. And so your, your loving wife or loving husband will say to you, what are you in a mood for? And you'll sit and go, I'm not in a mood. I'm not in a mood. But you are in a mood and you know you're in a mood. But because you can't work out why you're in a mood, you'll tell them you're not in a mood. But they're smart enough to know, no, no, you're in a mood. You've got a mood. And we're sitting there. Let me ask you a question. Is it just a bad mood? Or could there be something else happening behind the scenes? Do you, do you think that the, 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 the devil wants you in a good mood? Do you think that if he is there and there is a spiritual dimension, do you feel like it would be part of his agenda to go, well, I'm going to make sure that you're grumpy? Because grumpy people don't reflect Christ very well. I'm going to make sure you're always grumpy. I'm going to make sure you're in a bad mood. Could it be possible? Yeah, maybe you kicked your toe and maybe the, the, you, know, you ran out of cat food or maybe, you, maybe your wife went to the cupboard and you'd eaten half a bag of salt and vinegar chips, leaving the other half so you could watch it, eat them while you're watching the footy later and maybe you went to the cupboard and maybe they were gone, then maybe she took them and didn't think about that, you, you know, because you don't open a bag and eat the whole thing in one hit. You can pace yourself. Maybe, I'm just saying maybe. And, I've, and, and that person has asked himself, why are you in a mood? Is it because of the chips? Or could there be something going on behind the scenes? What about with sickness? Let me ask you a question. Every time you're sick, is it just a natural sickness? Is it just a, an amoeba or a virus in your body? Or could it be possible that there's something else happening behind the scenes? Could it be possible? Am I just feeling tired? I'm always tired. Am I just always feeling tired? Or could there be something going on behind the scenes? Am I just feeling flat and, dare I say, depressed? Could it just be chemical? Could it be, or could it possibly, potentially be, there's actually something else going on behind the scenes? Am I just going through a financial drought right now? Everything that comes in goes out and there's a constant hole there and, and as soon as the, the pay comes in, the bills go. Could it be just a natural thing that, hey, there's, there's the ins and outs and it's just a natural world? Or could it be that there's something going on behind the scenes? Are we just having a disagreement and a fight? Or could there be something going on behind the the scenes. Ever come to church on a Sunday? Does our gathering, is it, is it just flat because it's really hot? Does it just feel flat because everyone's tired? Just feel flat because we all sat up till midnight cheering on the Matildas and had Matilda parties after the game? Is it just, or could there be something else going on behind the scenes? Could there be an enemy that goes, I actually just don't want you people to worship Jesus this morning. I don't want you people to, to, to listen and, and really embrace communion. I don't want the name of Jesus lifted up. I don't want you to listen to a preacher who's going to read from this collection of ancient... I don't want any of that. I don't want you to go and talk to that person and have coffee with them because they may have good... I don't want that. I don't want you encouraging one another. Could it be that sometimes there's more going on behind the scenes? Do wars just break out between nations? Is it just that they hate each other and can't get on? Is it just that they're, they're economic issues or political issues... Or could there be more going on behind the scenes? What about with famines and things like that that happen in nations? Could, 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 this, could it just all be natural? It's just El Nino. It's just global warming. It's just this. It's just that. Could it all, is it all that? Or could it? Or could it be that there's something else going on over nations behind the scenes? Do people just not want to hear about Jesus? Do they just not care about the fact that there is historical evidence there? Do they not care that there is scientific evidence that validates things? Some of the stuff that was written in this thing thousands of years before science had the technology to discover certain things. I mean, it's, it's painfully obvious to me sitting this side of my faith, but back before my faith, it, it's not that I just didn't want to believe, I just, it was like I couldn't. 2 Corinthians 4.4 4 says this. It says, even if our gospel is veiled, it's veiled to those who are perishing, whose minds the God of this age has blinded. You ever thought about that? People, friends, family that you're trying to share faith with or, 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 or they, they, can, they can have event after event after event after event and you just get angry and frustrated going, why can't you see, you dummy? This is God, you dummy, you know? But, but Paul's saying here, you know what? The God of this age has blinded their minds so that they cannot see the light of the gospel of glory of Christ. What's he saying? He's saying there's something happening in another realm where there's this veil over their eyes and they can't see. Through a wrestle, not with flesh and blood. We wrestle with powers and principalities. Now, not every natural problem has its origins in the natural world. And not every natural problem can be solved by natural means. This is why as believers, we need to be aware spiritually of the fact that there is more going on than what we are picking up with our own natural five senses. 
And could it be that some of that more going on is interacting and interplaying with some of the stuff in my life that is actually going on? Could it be possible? Could it be possible? There shouldn't be a shock to us, because it wasn't a shock to the early church, and it's not a shock to anybody that uh, spends a bit of time reading this collection of ancient documents. There's a whole book in here about a guy called Job. Anyone ever read about a guy called Job? In the natural, he lost this, he lost that, he lost this, he lost that. But what do we know is going on? There was stuff going on behind the scenes, wasn't there? There was stuff going on in another dimension, in another realm. Now, praise God for Job and his faith. He just, he just said, it doesn't matter. I don't care what life throws at me. I don't care what it looks like. I will not curse God. I'm going to have faith. I'm going to trust God. Had a few friends that tried to jolt that out of him. But what we do know is that what happened to Job in the natural was an overflow of something that first happened spiritually. Amen? Something happened there. Numbers chapter 22. Anyone ever read the story of Balaam and the donkey? Yeah? Yeah? Everyone, people are chuckling away. Rod knows it. Balaam and the donkey. Here's Balaam. He gets on his donkey and he's, he's heading off to do something that he shouldn't be doing. And what happens is an angel stands in front of the donkey and the donkey rears up and Balaam turns around and starts smacking into the donkey. Like it's the donkey's fault. Thinking he's going to fix whatever's going on right now. If I beat the donkey, the donkey will do what I tell. So he beats the donkey. And the angel donkey goes around the angel and comes to another place and the angel appears and the donkey backs up against the wall or something, crushes Balaam's feet and he starts cursing the donkey and belting the donkey again thinking that if I just belt the donkey, it'll change whatever's happening here in the natural. But what he didn't realise until the donkey opened its mouth, now that would freak some people out, wouldn't it? The donkey opened his mouth and said, what are you doing? That's not me. There's an angel standing right there that doesn't want you going where you're going, trying to protect you, you dummy. And you're beating me. Hey, at least I can see what's going on. I'm more spiritually aware than you are. The donkey knew what was happening. So there's something here going on in Balaam's natural world and he's not even thinking, not even spiritually enough aware to think this could be something going on behind the veil, behind the scenes. So what does he do? He beats the donkey. Here's the thing. You can beat the donkey as much as you want. That, that problem was not a natural problem. It was a spiritual problem. Amen? It was a spiritual problem. Uh, in, in Mark chapter 9, we've got this story of a, a young boy. Jesus, uh, the father calls this young boy over, uh, calls Jesus over, this young boy that's struggling with epilepsy. We know it's epilepsy because when you read, uh, there's this spirit, he says, grabs him, he convulses, he foams at the mouth, he goes rigid. Uh, the doctors will tell you now that it's describing epilepsy. And here's a boy with epilepsy. And what does Jesus do? Well, Jesus goes over and Jesus casts the demon spirit out of this boy with epilepsy. Now, Hear me very clearly. I am not saying that every sickness is a demon. I'm not saying that. Don't anyone run out of here. They go, they preach at a rise that every sickness is always a devil. No, it's not. No, it's not. And I'll show you Mark chapter, uh, Matthew chapter 4, verse 24 says this, and I want it on the screen so you can see it, please. Then his fame went out, speaking of Jesus, to all Syria, and they brought to him all sick people who were afflicted with various diseases and tormented. There's two categories of sick people. Some of them had diseases and some were tormented. Then he even goes on and he says, uh, those who were tormented and those who were demon-possessed, and then he separates them from epileptics, and then he separates them again from paralytics or something. So please don't walk out of here and say, I'm saying every sickness is a demon. It's not. But what I'm saying to you, in this situation, Jesus came to a kid with epilepsy and he said, you know what, you can go to whatever doctor you want. They're not going to fix this problem because the problem is not a natural problem. It looks like a natural problem. It looks like epilepsy. So we'll go and get some medication, we'll fix it. But Jesus is here going, you can get whatever medication you want, brother, because the cause of this natural problem is spiritual. It's not a natural thing. And so he casts a demon out of this boy. I, I read a story this week and I, I printed it up here. I just want to read this out to you and I'll stick to the script because it's so good. They told me they were leaving. I said I wouldn't point them out, but bye-bye. <laughs> bye-bye. They've got a meeting to get to. So the story goes like this. This was a pastor and he's talking to his brother, right? So this pastor, he posed a question about the possible leaks between demon possession and mental illness, right? His brother-in-law is a board-certified psychiatrist and a Christian, which led him to pose the following question. What if I told you I was counselling someone who spoke in multiple different voices, was violent, prone to hurting others, and disposed to harming himself? How would you diagnose the person? And so the brother, who was the, 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 the board-certified psychiatrist, also a Christian, he said, well, not being able to examine the patient firsthand... My armchair diagnosis would lead me to believe that he was perhaps suffering from disassociative identity order or perhaps some sort of psychosis. The pastor asked him a probing and legitimate question. He said, why would you not say demon possession? 
After all, I just described the behaviour of the demoniac at the tomb of the Gadarenes, and the text clearly states he was demon possessed. Matthew 8, Mark 5, Luke 8. There's another dimension to life. Now, again, am I saying everybody in that situation has a demon spirit behind it? Is there something spiritual? I'm not saying that. But what I'm saying is sometimes we live so much in the natural realm and we fight battles against things and we beat our head against brick walls and we wonder why nothing's changing and nothing's shifting and nothing's moving. Maybe the natural problem you're facing doesn't have a natural solution. Maybe there's something going on behind the scenes. Maybe there's something more. The early church understood the other side of life. The early church understood that there was more to life than this see, taste, touch, feel, smell world that we live in. John 10.10, Jesus said this. He said, the thief comes to what? Steal, kill and destroy. And I've come that you might have life. In other words, I've come to give you something. I'm going to give you something. And there's an enemy and he's going to try to undo and stop you from having what I want to give you. He wants to take it all away from you. There's something going on in another realm. And Jesus says, I've come to give you life, but there is a definite enemy there that wants to come and get involved and do things as well. And he wants to undo all the great things that I want to do. 1 Peter 5.8 says, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. We wrestle not with flesh and blood. Not everything we're fighting, not everything we're wrestling with is flesh and blood. Right? Next time you have a fight with your husband or your wife, turn to them and say, hey, <laughs> you're not my enemy. You're not, well, I'm wrestling with you. I shouldn't be, you're not my enemy. Maybe there's something else going on here. Maybe there's something else going on behind the scenes. Let's, let's pray. Let's get our spiritual awareness on. Let's put our antenna up, as Annalise was talking about this one. Let's get that antenna up and let's tune in a little bit to the spiritual side of life. We don't need to become weird, kooky Christians, Right? We don't be, who knows weird kooks? I know weird kooks. I know plenty of them, okay? I've been with weird kooks. I'm not talking about getting weird and kooky. I don't think we have to be weird and kooky. But we have to be aware that there is a spiritual dimension out there that is just as real as the dimension in which we live in right now. It's just as real. Uh, Acts chapter 19, verse 11 to 20. We can tie all this up with a story from the book of Acts. It says, Now God worked unusual miracles by the hands of Paul. So that even handkerchiefs or aprons were brought from his body to the sick. How cool would that be? How cool would that be? Huh? Just go to bed. Anyone go to bed with like a towel on their head or anything like that? And in the morning, your wife just takes it off and sells it online because it's got healing powers and buys you a new car or something. You know. Handkerchiefs, aprons, things like that. It's kind of weird. I've been in nations where they do that. I've been in nations in, in India and so on where, where they will do that. They'll, 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 they'll pray over hankies and so on. And they'll send them home with a, 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 a Christian wife whose husband hates the Lord. And they'll pray over these cloths. And, 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 and she'll go home and she'll put it under his, his mattress at night time when he sleeps. And I've heard stories of, of, the, of the guy being delivered of alcoholism and so on or, or not being able to sleep and just having this compulsion. I need to pick up that Bible that my wife has or whatever. I've heard stories of that. That kind of stuff happened back then. I don't see any reason why. It still couldn't happen today. Never happened to me. I mean, don't, please, I'll pray over a hanky for you if you want, but don't, don't use it first because that'd be gross. <laughs> Aprons and all this stuff brought from his body to the sick and the, and the thing is the diseases left them and the evil spirits went out of them. That's God's spiritual influence on the natural world right there. The spiritual influence of God on the natural world. And then what happens? Then some of the Jewish uh, exorcists took it upon themselves to call the name of the Lord Jesus over those who had evil spirits, saying, we exercise you by the Jesus whom Paul preaches. Paul wasn't exercising anyone by the Jesus that someone else preached. He knew Jesus. He had a relationship with Jesus. And also there were seven sons of Sceva, a Jewish chief priest who did so. And the evil spirit answered and said, Jesus I know and Paul I know, but who are you? Then the man in whom the evil spirit was leapt on them. Can you imagine being present and seeing this? This actually happened. Leapt on them, overpowered them and prevailed against them. So they fled out of the house naked and wounded. Not only did he beat the tar out of them, stripped their clothes off and humiliated them as well. All right? And, 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 and so here we've got Paul with handkerchiefs coming to him and then people being delivered and healed and we're seeing the, the spiritual influence of God for good in the world. Here we're seeing the influence of the enemy in the natural world where, where this, this demonic spirit is overpowering flesh and blood people, beating the tar out of them, stripping their clothes off them and sending them running. Now watch what happened. This became known to all Jews and Greeks dwelling in Ephesus. Can you imagine if that happened this morning at church? Can you imagine if Paul Worth 
prayed over some hankies and we took them around and people got healed. Notable healings right here in the spot. And then, I can't use, then Rodney went to pray for somebody and demons overpowered and jumped on him and beat him up. And I'm just using Rodney because I know he can take it. Now imagine if you saw that, that incredible display of the power of God uh, manifesting itself here in the natural realm and then at the same time seeing the power of the enemy manifesting itself in the natural realm. What difference would it make to you? Well, here's what it did to them. It says, This became known to Jews and Greeks dwelling in Ephesus and the fear and fear fell on all of them. All of a sudden they went, Oh, hang on, this spiritual thing is, it's real. It's not something to be toyed with and played around with. This is, this is real life with real life consequences. That realm and this realm, they're not two disconnected things. They're welded together by divine design. And they interact and they have an impact on each other. Wow. And then look what they did. The name of the Lord Jesus was magnified. And many who had believed came. All of a sudden they're going, we better get some stuff out in the open here. Because God has power and God does things. The enemy has things happen. That we, 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 we better take this thing serious. And all of a sudden it says that many who believed they came and they started confessing and telling their deeds. Let's get this stuff in the dark out in the open. I don't want to give the enemy a foothold anywhere. I'm going to get it out. I'm going to get it out. Also, many of those who had practiced magic brought their books together and burned them in the sight of all. Anything that I've got that may be some sort of connection to that realm, if it's not good, I want it out of my world. I'm not going to throw it in the bin so that somebody can find I'm going to burn this thing. Anyone here, remember a few years ago, some of you might remember back a long, long time ago, we had a lady come here, uh, got saved here, and uh, sorry, got saved elsewhere, came here, and a family started getting saved here. And then uh, one day she uh, called me and Jackie and said, look, I've got some books and things at home. I want you to come and tell me if they're good or bad. We didn't. We, we had a look at them and we knew straight away they're bad. But we're not going to tell you to get rid of them. So we said to her, why don't you pray? And asked the Lord, what do you think you should do with them? The next Sunday, she brought boxes of them. And after church, we went around the side there, big 44-gallon drum. And we, Daniel got the guitar out. We had worship. We worshipped around the fire and we, as she chucked all these books in. And it was such a beautiful, beautiful time. But she burned all this stuff. They had these connections to a life that she didn't want anymore, but also connections potentially to spiritual things that she didn't want hanging around. It says they brought all this stuff and they burned them. So something happened as a result of their spiritual awareness. They realised that nothing happens in the dark. They started confessing and they started getting rid of anything that might be a connection point. And they counted up the value of them and it totaled 50,000 pieces of silver. So the word of the Lord grew mightily and prevailed. So the reason many of us struggle with spiritual awareness is because you can't quantify the spiritual realm. You can't measure it. You can't contain it with human logic. You can't plot it on a graph. You can't control it through human resources or means. But it's as real as anything that you can. It's as real as anything that you can. And it was real to the early believers. I'm going to finish up here. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 17 to 18. Let's get the guys to come back. I want to finish with uh, Waymaker if we can. If we've got time. 1 Thessalonians 2, 17 to 18. Paul writes this. He says, But we, brothers, having been taken away from you for a short time in presence, but not in heart, we endeavoured more eagerly to see your face with great desire. In other words, we wanted to come and see you. He says, Therefore, we wanted to come to you, even I, Paul, time and again. But what? <coughs> Satan hindered me. Satan hindered me. It wasn't that... It wasn't that I, I didn't have money for fuel, so I couldn't come, you know. It wasn't that all the, all the flights, all the seats on the bus were booked and I just couldn't seem to get. I went to get a plane and the plane, it, it, there was no flights left on the plane. It was uncanny. So I went and thumbed a ride and nobody had stopped. Normally a thousand people stopped. I flash a lead, they all stopped for me. I don't know, you know. He says, I tried time and time again to get you. Be spiritually aware enough to know, but you know who stopped me? And Satan got in the way. The devil was hindering me. The devil was hindering me. Let me finish with a question. Could you be facing anything this morning? No matter what you do in the natural, it just doesn't seem to change. Could it be that there's something going on behind the scenes in your world this morning? Could it be that God wants you this morning to get a little bit more spiritually aware? And not just think that that's just for the weird kooks. That's normal life. As far as believers are concerned, it's normal. I've, I've, I've used a couple of little scriptures here, but I challenge you, go back and read it. You'll see it all over the place. We wrestle not with flesh and blood people. 
Not everything's a devil, but not everything's not. Some things are. And the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they're mighty in God, pulling down strongholds, setting people free, seeing healing flow, seeing deliverance come, restoring relationships, bringing wisdom into places that need it. So we're going to finish. We're going to sing this. Service is over. You know the drill. You want to grab a tea, coffee? You can't. But can I encourage you? Ask yourself that question. Is there something going on right now? Maybe. Maybe you're trying to beat that natural thing in a natural way. And maybe God's saying to you this morning, hey, it's this natural problem. It has a spiritual solution. Maybe you need to get into some prayer. Maybe you need to get on your knees. Maybe you need to wage a bit of warfare. Not against your kids. Not against your spouse, not against your friends or your neighbours, not against your boss. Maybe there's something going on behind the scenes. That's you this morning. I want you to do a bit of business with God. We're going to do the same as normal. We're going to open up the front. If anybody would like to be prayed for um, by the leaders, we're happy to pray with you. You don't have to be prayed that way. If you want to grab somebody there, pray with them. Can I encourage you? When the Holy Spirit speaks to you and God is talking, don't just rush off to the next thing. It's too important. God's word to us is too important. God's involvement in our life is too important to just get up, turn the TV off and move on to the next thing. Listen to what the Spirit might be saying to you. So Father, I want to pray for us this morning. Lord, I I thank you, God, that Father, we live in this natural world and my goodness, it's a beautiful world. There's a lot of stuff that goes on that that isn't great, but Lord, the beaches, the, the trees, the butterflies, God, the creeks, mountains, Looking out there this morning, a beautiful blue sky. Father, what a great, great world. God, the beautiful relationships we get to build with people, the things we get to see. God, the art. There's just so much, the music. So many great things in this world, Lord. But Father, we want to acknowledge this morning too, God, that there is another dimension to life. We can't necessarily see, taste, touch, feel or smell it. But Lord, you give us the capacity to be aware of it and to discern it. And so, Father, I pray for each person in this room this morning, God. I pray, Lord, that we would, as Annalise said this morning, God, just cause that antenna to go up. God, maybe some people here started off very spiritually aware. They knew what was going on, and and maybe over time they've just got tired. Maybe over time they've just dropped the ball. Maybe over time they just felt like the battle was too hard or whatever, God. And, Lord, I, I pray for them this morning, God. I pray, God, just revive Uh, their hearts, Lord, this morning, God. Revive people's spirits this morning, Lord. And God, make us a people, as the early church were, that are aware, Father, that it's not just this natural world that we contend with, but there is a spiritual world. And we wrestle, and we wrestle, and we wrestle, and it's not always flesh and blood. But you've given us weapons, God, to overcome. And we thank you for that, Father, in Jesus' name. Everybody said? Amen. Amen.